This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is our second session on economic relations, and we're looking at uh, investments. We're about five minutes ahead of programme, and Leslie Bethel instructs me to ensure that we remain five minutes ahead of programme so that we have ample time for the final speaker. Once again, we have uh, two, two presenters, and they'll be focusing on slightly different aspects of the investment debate. Uh, on my far right, we have uh, Dr. Georg Fischer, Assistant Professor of uh, Brazilian Studies at Aarhus University. And on my immediate right, uh, Dr. Thomas Mills, uh, Lecturer in Diplomacy and Foreign Policy at uh, Lancaster. Uh, Georg has worked on globalization and economic nationalism and about British-US rivalry in Latin America. He's published on mining technology, uh, networks of experts, and the diffusion uh, of knowledge. Today, he's going to talk about big money, making enterprises of the world, bearings, and the Brazilian iron project revisited. Uh, Thomas uh, has worked in a not dissimilar field, 20th century international relations, particularly U.S. Latin American foreign policy, and also U.S. Uh, British relations, not least uh, focused on Latin America. Uh, he recently published his big book, congratulations, uh, about post-war planning on the periphery, which looks at uh, UK-US relations in South America during the Second World War. Uh, this afternoon, he's going to talk about the electrification of the Central Railway in Brazil and British interests in Latin America during the uh, Second World War. But we kick off with Georg. OK, thank you very much. Um, so my, my talk is based on uh, my PhD thesis, or at least one, one chapter on it. Um, the thesis deals with Brazil's iron ore deposits as an object of knowledge production in the late 19th and, and early 20th centuries. And there I try to interweave um, the histories of geological prospection, scientific theorization, economic policy, and transnational business, uh, using an analytical framework of circulations of knowledge, both across geographic space and from one societal field to another. Um, so I, I would argue that tracing these threads and networks that develop around iron ore allows us to construct new narratives of old themes, like uh, the global impact of North Atlantic uh, industrialization, the spread of, of Western science, and Latin American developmental thought. One important episode in this story was uh, the involvement of the British merchant bank Barings in the organization of a uh, business scheme to mine and export Brazil's iron ore. I will discuss this project on two different levels. So at one level, I would like to correct some major shortcomings or misconceptions of the existing literature, which has failed to understand um, some of the dynamics behind this project. And I will reconstruct uh, this evolving network um, based on the, the Barings archive and some other archives in the US and Brazil. Um, at another level, I'd like to make some methodological suggestions. Um, so one, one is, and uh, Rory Miller wrote this uh, 20 years ago, that the history of foreign investment should uh, open up for research questions beyond history, uh, business history. Um, so I would, I would like to use investors and markets here uh, as, an, as an element of, uh, of the history of knowledge. Perhaps that's a long way uh, of saying that I, I'm not a business historian. Or I don't consider myself to be a business historian. Um, but I, I, I still use these archives. Um, further, although I deal with an important moment in uh, British-Brazilian relations, I propose that we should avoid narratives that presuppose the spatial scale. Um, so we should not think in containers like Britain and Brazil, but instead follow the paths of our actors or objects um, wherever they may take us. Of course, these are suggestions that um, are consistent with proposals from global history, um, but also uh, recent approaches in imperial history that emphasize networked structures of empire and um, crisscrossing of borders within and without the imperial space. Okay, 
but uh, now I will tell you my story. Uh, Gaspar Ferrer, and you help me with the pronunciation if I don't get it right, I'm not a native speaker. Uh, the gentleman who's standing there, vice chairman of Bearings, although I'm talking about uh, uh, 1911, so he was a bit younger in the story that I'm telling. Um, spent his summer holidays of 1911 in Canada visiting his friend James Hill, a railway magnate of the American Northwest. Uh, Hill's business empire included the Great Northern Railway, which connected the Great Lakes with Seattle. And he also controlled about 30% uh, of the iron mines in the Mesabi Range in Minnesota, um, then the most important mining district uh, in the world. Hill told Farrer that a professor of geology from the University of Wisconsin in Madison had come to see him. Charles Richard Van Heys, a leading scholar of the, uh, in, in the economic geology of iron ore, he had secured land titles in the Brazilian state of Minas Gerais. And um, both Hill and Van Heys, they shared common interests in questions of uh, converse, uh, conservation of mineral resources. Um, and they shared a preoccupation that was virulent at the time that America's iron ore resources would face depletion within a matter of decade, decades. And, and this was, as I found out, uh, quite a, 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 an international concern, both in Europe and, and the United States. The end of the Iron Age. Um, Van Heise's group was one of several contenders in an ongoing iron rush in Brazil which had started in the late 1900s and reached its height after the publication in 1910 uh, of a report on the iron ore resources of the world by the International Geological Congress. And this is a detail uh, of one of the maps that were, that were produced, um, the first global inventory of, of, a, of a mineral resource uh, produced by scientists, an international community of scientists. And Brazil featured quite prominently here, especially because uh, those deposits there were so um, concentrated regionally. Um, Van Heys then organized, when he heard of this, and he, he was, uh, of course, part of this uh, scientific community, um, organized the Brazilian Iron and Steel Company and gave out shares to uh, industrialists from the American Midwest. Um, and transport entrepreneurs, but also to many of his colleagues from, from uh, academia, including his close friend, historian Frederick Jackson Turner. Um, Ferrer was quite impressed by Hill's enthusiasm regarding the Brazilian iron ore project and decided to convince his fellow directors at Barings that the bank should not, not miss this opportunity and join the business. Um, the bank had regained its renome after the Bering crisis in 1890, when it had to be rescued after risky financial investments in Argentina. However, although about a quarter of uh, British overseas investments went into mining, Bering's had not dealt with minerals for several decades. Now, Farrer uh, viewed this Brazil proposal as an opportunity to generate reliable long-term profits that would further strengthen the bank's comeback. Um, so he was convinced that, and this is where I take the title from, uh, quote, if properly handled, it would be the big money-making enterprise of the world, unquote. The fact that Rothschilds were turning forcefully to minerals like oil in Azerbaijan and copper and diamonds in southern Africa was another argument that worked effectively to convince uh, the bank's directors uh, that they should approach the, the uh, Brazilian <coughs> Iron and Steel Company. John Barings now reached out to potential partners. Uh, the first one was uh, investor Ernest Castle, who had crucial connections to the British and Swedish iron and steel industries. The Swedish ores uh, were similar to the Brazilian ones in their concentration and phosphorus content, virtually perfect Bessemer ore. And Castle's Swedish partners knew Van Heys uh, very well, and his great theoretical work on metallogenetic processes um, and on the application of this knowledge to mining practice. In July of 1911, 
uh, Van Heys came to London to present this business, uh, his proposal and initiate negotiations. Um, there, there was a, an existing railway line in the region. Uh, so we're talking about the uh, Quadrilatero Ferrifero in Minas. And there was this existing railway line, uh, the Estrage Ferro Vitoria Minas, um, controlled by, by French um, capitalists. But it was technically unfit to transport heavy ore loads uh, over 550 kilometers from the mines to the port. So Van Heys needed partners in the city and lots of capital to control the railway and upgrade it. Um, in these meetings, that's quite an, an interesting moment from the perspective of how knowledge circulates, how uh, these uh, uh, bankers uh, meet a scientist um, uh, and, and, and uh, how this knowledge then travels, he was clearly an outsider to the world of finance. And after meeting the bankers, uh, they judged him to be a man of science and not a man of business. They were convinced that the professor lacked imagination to recognize the scale and complexity of the business. However, adventurous investments like this one to open up the world's commodity frontiers required the expertise of outsiders such, such as Van Heys. Then another investor joined the club, uh, Sir Alexander Henderson and his investment firm Greenwood, specialized in Latin American railways, telegraphs, and electricity. Um, in Brazil, he controlled the Leopoldina Railway uh, with a network between Rio Espiritu Santo and the Zona da Mata in Minas, um, and the Port of Victoria Company, obviously uh, strategic to the business. His Brazilian partners were businessmen like Pedro Nolasco and João Teixeira Suarez, who were experienced railway engineers with excellent contacts to Brazilian politicians. So these networks uh, were vital for the whole enterprise, and Henderson would take a leading role. However, um, as Barings learned soon after, British industrialists and trading companies had already founded another company to develop the Brazilian iron ore deposits. And they had been on, in, in the field years before Van Heys. And this was the, the famous Itabira Iron Ore Company, controlled by coal traders Harris and Dixon, uh, Lloyds Bank, and um, a couple of steel producers like Samuelsons. Um, this company had bought or leased ore deposits from the Brazilian Hematite Syndicate. And this syndicate, in turn, was the creation of members of the British engineering diaspora, uh, who in the late 1900s were the pioneers in the iron rush. So British engineers that were actually engaged in, in other activities in Brazil and in their free time uh, ventured to Minas. Um, and I thought they were actually looking for gold, but they found iron ore. Um, although this, the Itabira company would have to pay these people royalties on their iron lands, um, the deposits controlled by the company had a great advantage. They were concentrated around the town of Itabira. Uh, I think this map shows it a bit better. This is the, the original map from the um, Iron Ore Report. Here is Itabira. And um, these massive hematite ore bodies around Itabira estimated, were estimated to bear 60 to 70 million tons of high-grade iron ore. So Itabira, both the town and the company, now became the name of, of the Brazilian iron rush. The Itabira company also had made a transport agreement with the Victoria Minas, the railway. The railway agreed to transport up to 3 million tons of iron ore per year and the Itabira company agreed to deliver 20% of its ore production to French steelworks because the Victoria Minas was controlled by French. Um, furthermore, the company had signed contracts with British, and, and, uh, British iron and steel producers like Samuelson, Dunlop, Baldwin, Port Talbot, and Blaine Nevin. Um, so all this structure was in place before Barings even heard about the business. Van Heys changed his plans once he realized that the Itabira company could establish a transport monopoly in the region and block the outlet for other parties. The Americans now tried to compete with the British in the Itabira district and in this way force Barings to cooperate with both parties, 
Land prices uh, in the Itabira district rose drastically as the Americans bought as much iron land as they could. Barings, Castle and Henderson sent several railway and mining engineers to Brazil. On the one hand, uh, they needed reliable technical plans to go ahead with the project. But on the other hand, I would argue, these experts were a currency of trust. Having a man on the spot symbolized commitment to the business. Um, the experts brought in experience from many different backgrounds. For example, Henderson sent the Anglo-Swiss railway engineer Gustav Gilman, um, who had worked for him on Spanish copper railroads. Uh, he, he designed a plan for the upgraded railway um, and um, be later became resident engineer of the Vitoria Minas and never returned to Europe. Bearings constantly urged for more American involvement in the, and expertise, so in the planning process. Farah envisioned the, pro, uh, the project as a problem that required American solutions, and he frequently consulted engineer John Stevens, who had saved the Panama Canal from failure a couple of years earlier, um, as, a, as a consulting engineer. Um, that was, I think, mainly because uh, the Rio Dorsey Valley was uh, uh, disease-ridden tropical backwater by the time, and, and the project was perceived um, as having similar dimension to, 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 uh, to um, other major engineering wonders. James Hill sent Alexander Lupfer, an engineer working for the Great Northern. Um, Lupfer suggested the complete reconstruction of the Victoria Minas for a capacity of 10 million tons per year, and that was certainly the American solution Farah had in mind. Those experts were quite important uh, for the ongoing negotiations. For example, Max Nottmeyer, a, a German geologist hired by Ernest Castle, argued that most of the American properties could not be developed at a profit due to their location and their high phosphorus content. And this changed the course of negotiations in London, which now exclusively dealt with the deposits in Itabira and ignored all the other uh, deposits. After several rounds of negotiations marked by mistrust between the bankers and the industrialists, uh, Harris and Dixon came to an agreement with Henderson's investment firm Greenwood. And Greenwood took over the control, uh, control of the company and Barings provided a loan to purchase the Vitoria Minas. The zone privileges of the railroad convinced Barings that controlling it meant a transport monopoly in the Dossa River Valley, which was seen as a region of great strategic importance for Brazil's economic future. It's often referred to like the, the, the Brazilian Mississippi or um, the Amazon of the Southeast. Um, a result of this whole constellation was that from now on, Barings acted increasingly as a representative of the Itabira Iron Ore Company. Ah, this was a quote on this mistrust. Uh, I tried to just for you to get some orientation, uh, outline this network a little bit. Um, so with the, 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 the British company uh, on the right top, the American company on the left top, bearings kind of as the nodal point in this whole network, uh, the, the Brazilian context, uh, context over there, and, and um, the um, representatives of the city of London in the center. And Barings uh, really was the nodal point in this. But two obstacles remained. Uh, the Brazilian government still had to be convinced, and the Brazilian, uh, sorry, the American and British interests in the mining district still had to be merged, since the Americans were not part of the deal. In late 1912, Cecil Baring went on a six weeks trip to Brazil to secure government subsidies for the reconstruction and extension of the Victoria Minas. Um, the uh, uh, Barings wanted the, the government's interest guarantees that uh, covered the Victoria Minas to cover now also the fresh capital that they would inject for the upgrade of the railway. But reservations on the Brazilian side were great. On, on the one hand, interest guarantees had never been applied to a project of such dimensions. Um, 
Further, many Brazilian politicians thought interest guarantees for this project represented almost like a direct subsidy for the British steel industry. On the other hand, Brazilian politicians felt increasingly uncomfortable about exporting minerals in general. The, the discourse of global scarcity had reached Brazil, and politicians were very sensi sensitive about the long-term consequences of any decision. In meetings with Cecil Baring, President Hermes da Fonseca insisted that the main objective of the Brazilian government was the establishment of a national iron and steel industry. As a reaction, Baring assured the Minister of Public Works, José Barbosa Gonçalves, that his group was willing to build a metallurgical plant in the country and that the project would reduce the import costs um, of coal and, and, and thus would be boosting the Brazilian econ economy as a whole. However, this rather vague promise of the metallurgical plant was uh, only fulfilled through the basic provisions of Brazilian legislation was never actually included in, in any of the plans that uh, Barings uh, prepared. Um, Bering sought to enhance his cred credibility by using scientific arguments. He borrowed from a memorandum written by Professor Van Heys. When he left Rio, he sent President Hermes a copy and, uh, of this memorandum and praised Van Heys as a famous economist and eminent authority regarding the conservation of national wealth. He did not mention, however, that the scientist himself was heavily invested in Brazil's iron ore. Uh, the argument that the Itabira project could lead to Brazil's industrial takeoff uh, was spread through a concerted lobbying effort targeting government officials, newspapers, and members of the Brazilian Congress. In a long letter, uh, Teixeira Suarez, Teixeira Suarez, here he is, um, tried to convince the influential Gaúcho senator José Gomes Pinheiro Machado of the benefits uh, the reduced trade costs would bring uh, to all sectors of the, of the economy. According to Teixeira Suárez, opposition to the Bering Plan was equivalent to leso patriotismo. At least Bering could count on the support of some deputies from Espiritu Santo and Minas Gerais, but they again were confronted with fierce attacks by economic nationalists who denounced that they were being manipulated by foreign capital the Jornal do Comércio established a direct connection between the liberal views of some deputies and the presence of a, quote, very rich Englishman in the capital. So Cecil Baring tried everything. He tried to build up pressure by involving the Foreign Office. Uh, he presented letters of recommendation from Natty Rothschild, um, and uh, he paid bribes to government officials. Uh, which he described in his letters, uh, but it was all uh, of no, uh, it was all useless. The bill was passed in Congress under dubious circumstances, but the government declined to publish the decree and sign a new contract. According to Baring, it was due to the positivistic worldview of some cabinet members. Consul Haggard added that the nationalistic fervor of the Brazilian government and public was a reaction to the spectacular expansion of Percival Farquhar's business empire in railways, colonization, uh, and other fields. And officials at the Foreign Office noted that Baring had probably not paid enough to get his degree, decree. Um, however, I think all these observers underestimated the power of conservationist ideas among Brazil's political elites that attached strategic value to mineral resources. Brazilians closely watched the, the ways other countries dealt with minerals, and they were determined not to emulate, say, the experience of Spain, whose mining regions uh, were seen as the impoverished extractivist periphery of, this, of the British steel industry. Um, so at the heart of, the, of Brazil's economic nationalism, prior to the First World War was also a a rather clear assessment of global asymmetries and not just lazy resistance to the arguments of science as the, 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 the interested parties put it and many historians later. Um, uh, talking, just some remarks on the, on the, on the historiography. Um, the Brazilian nationalist literature 
usually touches upon this group headed by Barings vaguely as a conglomerate of imperialistic interests. And this has created some uh, long-lasting myths. For example, some texts argue that Cecil Rhodes was the leader of the group. Others state that the whole enterprise was organized by Rothschilds. Perhaps these two uh, serve as symbols uh, to conjure some imperialist uh, conspiracy. Um, but they are factual errors. Rhodes had died in 1902, and Rothschilds hardly knew, the, knew about the scheme. Um, these errors can be traced back to memoirs and source collections published by Brazilian mineral nationalists like Clodomiro de Oliveira and Dermival José Pimenta. On the flip side of this coin uh, is uh, Charles Gold's biography of Percival Farquhar, The Last Titan. Farquhar took over co the control of the Itabira Iron Ore Company after the war. Gold's narrative tells the heroic struggle of an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial uh, American Quaker against stubborn and backward Brazilians. Um, and he projects this interpretation also onto the, the pre-war pre years, although he didn't work with any sources from that period, um, just uh, with his interviews of Farco himself, who had nothing to do with iron ore before the war. Another common mistake is to st the statement that uh, the Itabira Iron Ore Company was created and controlled by Barings. Um, as my story uh, tells, this was not the case. But again, it, it uh, kind of assumes this high degree of coherence and homogeneity of imperialist interests. In fact, Barings' project consisted of the attempt to unite two existing networks and merge them into one uh, single group, um, which until the end failed to materialize. Experts on the spot played an important role in this story. Whatever they reported home had a profound impact on the negotiations in London. Eventually, they gained autonomy to a degree that led to fierce British-American rivalry in the Itabira district. So Bering's failure to develop Brazil's iron ore was as much due to the Brazilian government's unwillingness to export minerals as to the fact that uh, American and British prospectors failed sorry, faced each other as enemies on top of the biggest hematite body in the world, the Pico, uh, Pico do Cauê in Itabira. And that's a picture of this iron mountain, then already populated by uh, British and American prospectors. Um, thank you very much. That's the end of my story.